Great. Well, we're seven o'clock, everyone. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining. So often there's um, some difference, some differences um, or misunderstandings, shall we say. Um, so tackling the difference, I suppose, between a learning disability and what we what we would describe as a learning difficulty. So people will have learning difficulties, which are, you know, the obvious things, problems with reading and writing. Um, you know, other emotional problems that perhaps have effect, affected somebody's ed education, things like ADHD or Asperger's and some individuals with autism. Now, I think really, I suppose, one of the best ways to kind of describe or highlight the differences is that if you've got a learning disability, that learning disability is likely to impact on all aspects of your life. If you've got a learning difficulty, there might be some things you can do perfectly well and without support, without help, but struggle with some aspects. Um, and we know that the terms themselves are used interchangeably as well. So that often gets a bit confusing. And some of the people that we know who've got a learning disability will say, I've got learning difficulties when actually we know they've got a learning disability because it almost perhaps has a bit less of that kind of stigma attached to it. So you know, we're aware that the terms are used interchangeably, um, but there are, there are some very definite differences between a learning disability and a learning difficulty. So in, in practice, in primary care, you know, there are, there are lists, there's a learning disability quaff list, and what we've got is a learning disability register code that we want to apply or add to those patients that we know about who have got a learning disability and I mentioned very at the very beginning it's one of our key roles is to come into practices we come into practice or we can do it remotely if you're on system one um, to actually uh, look at look through your quaff list and, and work out those people that have got a learning disability and therefore are eligible back in 2019 there was some guidance um, introduced to help to highlight the differences between learning difficulty and learning disability and the basic um, search that you could run to make sure you basically you're not missing anybody from your learning disability lists can we have the next slide please because this kind of explains it so at the moment and this has changed in the last probably 12 months maybe a little longer um, so NHS England, for the purposes of counting people, the NHS England count everybody on the COF list who is age 14 and over as being eligible for the health check. Now, we know from looking at those COF lists that not everybody on there will have a learning disability. Some will have learning difficulties, as previously described. And so what we want to do is try and kind of narrow that list down to only those people that are eligible. So that's been a bit of a task for us, certainly in the last sort of six, six or eight months, really, to, to try and get to the bottom of how, how we are counting people versus the systems and how it pulls, out, pulls people out of the system. So on your quaff list, you're likely to have people who've got a learning difficulty. You're likely to have people who've got um, autism but no learning, learning disability. You're likely to have people even with things like cerebral palsy or some hearing or visual impairment. So what we want to do is actually narrow that list down to only those people that are eligible for the learning disability health check. So um, you can, if you if you're interested, if you're curious, if you have, if you if you you know want to know more, then your link strategic health facilitator will have probably looked at your register. If, you, if you're in Derbyshire within the last 12 maybe 18 months and if that's not happened then certainly get in touch with us and we'll we can come and have another look um the the challenge here is is to do with the codes and how we take people off the quaff um, the codes have been applied in childhood so the historic codes can't easily be removed so we're not we're not at the end of this particular journey as yet uh, in terms of identifying patients so from what we know from lo locally checking registers, like I say, there's, there's a, around about almost 6,000 people across Derby and Derbyshire that are eligible uh, for the learning disability health checks. NHS England have got that number at, at slightly, well, higher than that, probably about 
seven thousand seven and a half thousand so there's a big there's a bit of a discrepancy so if you want more information or if you want us to come and have a look at your register then by all means just let us know um this we'll have the next slide please so a big big consideration for people with a learning disability is making those reasonable reasonable adjustments and you know when we talk we do groups and we do sessions with people with a learning disability and their families and their carers uh just to kind of raise the awareness around annual health checks that sort of thing and you know we do remind people that you know because you've got a learning disability it doesn't mean that you're at the front of the queue or that you get a priority necessarily but what we want is to make sure those reasonable adjustments have been implemented so that people with a learning disability get the same options and the same outcomes as any patient without. So things like, you know, using simple, excuse me, <coughs> simple, straightforward language and speaking clearly and checking that the patient's understood what you've said almost always needing to allow extra time people with a learning disability may take longer to understand and make themselves understood too working closely with family members and, and their you know support workers or, or your carers or whoever talk to the person with the learning disability obviously but family members can help you kind of decipher or work out what somebody's trying to tell you Quite crucially as well, this is one of the things that we think um, that is, is perhaps missing a little is ask the person, ask the person what reasonable, reasonable adjustments they need. Uh, and if they might not be able to tell you, their family member, carer, support worker, whoever it might be, will be able, will be able to tell you. Um, we often get approached by workers you know, or you've got workers in our team who go, well, we went to this practice or we went there or we went here and nobody offered any reasonable adjustments. Mm -hmm. Did they know which reasonable adjustments to offer? Has anybody asked or, you know, told the practice what, what that individual might need? So it's OK to ask. I think it's OK to ask. So in that point where you're perhaps arranging appointments for people or, you know, inviting people to come in for health checks, you know, it's OK to say, is there anything, you know, is there anything we can do? you know, to make this experience better. So it's okay to ask, I think, about what reasonable adjustments might be needed. And, you know, it's almost quite, it's almost always helpful, perhaps, to have uh, information in an easy read format. It's not suitable for absolutely everybody, but generally people will appreciate something that's slightly simpler and, and you know, quite clearly laid out um, with pictures or symbols to help them to understand. And it might be that they take that away with them and somebody goes through it with them. You know, it might, you might have to go through it a few times for them to kind of understand what's being said. But accessible information is quite a useful and quite a key reasonable adjustment for people. Um, that's Mark, just chip in if I've, I missed something. I'm rabbiting away and I'm, I'm actually, I might have forgotten something. Um, so can we have the next, we'll have the next slide because we've got some examples here and they're not, it's not an exhaustive list and we've got, we've got some guidance for all sorts of resources that we can supply about reasonable adjustments and things you can think about depending on the circumstances. But generally, Things like either the first or the last appointment may may be suitable for somebody. They might want to come in and get it over and done with while it's perhaps not too busy. They might want to wait till the, the end of the day. Um, allowing patients to pre-book appointments is probably a, a big one as well. If, like we said, somebody's got a mild learning disability and they don't have a huge amount of support, it might be that they've got the support worker on a Monday and a Wednesday and actually they need to come in, but it won't come in until next Wednesday. If they were allowed to get the support worker to ring up and pre-book an appointment, that makes going to be, make life a lot easier. For people with a learning disability, you know, we've, we've got to, you know, we have to get on the telephone at a certain time in the morning and kind of wait in a queue to get an appointment. That's a lot more challenging for somebody with a learning disability to be able to get that. So even though they may have recognised they need to see a doctor, actually 
getting that end goal is probably a bit trickier for people with a learning disability. So if they can pre-book, that'd be brilliant. Easy read information, like I've already mentioned, always really useful. It may be appropriate to have a separate uh, waiting area for people with a learning disability. And I know the kind of the, the, the look of waiting rooms has changed post COVID. It's not ever so busy and, you know, they've not got as many chairs and stuff. But it might be that somebody wants somewhere quieter to wait while they're waiting their turn. Uh, they might want to wait in the car and just, you know, call them in when it's their turn, that sort of thing. Some people might not like being in noisy rooms and noisy waiting rooms. Um, this might be, I know this might be a bit controversial, but consider home visit for annual health check. In some circumstances, there may be some individuals that actually they ain't coming to the surgery no matter what. And it might be easier to, to do a home visit, particularly if you're concerned. They've got lots of, you know, um, health problems that perhaps need, need addressing. Weekend or evening appointments, particularly for your younger population, offering health checks to people who are 14 and over. Quite often they'll be at school or college or whatever. They'll have working age parents who are also at work. You know, a daytime appointment's perhaps not the best for, for the young for younger patients. So weekends or evenings or even something in the school holidays. We've got school holidays coming up. Um, so school holiday appointments for, for your younger patients might be a better way of, of um, you know, getting them to attend. And again, it depends on the practice. It depends on the practice size. It depends on the number of patients. But, you know, if you can make a telephone call to the patient to remind them that they've got an appointment, you know, you might be setting aside, you know, 30, 40 minutes for the annual health check. You know, it's probably worth somebody's, you know, a couple of minutes of somebody's time in the practice to check that they're coming because otherwise that appointment could be could be um you know wasted it could be that they've forgotten whatever so ringing people to remind them um i think that's everything next slide please i feel very important doing that next <laughs> slide, please communication is the other big key i think for people with a learning disability we know Lots and lots of people with the learning disability will have some difficulties with communication. Um, I think the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists said about 90% of people with a learning disability will have some sort of communication difficulty, whether that's a visual problem, a hearing problem, not being able to read, there's all sorts of things. So using accessible language, using straightforward language, avoiding you know, your medical words and your jargon, um, and those kinds of idioms as well, you know, asking somebody how the water works or that sort of thing is probably not not the best way of of, of talking about a particular subject. Um, I suppose being prepared as well to use um, different communication tools, and, and we've got again we've got a range of sort of um, easy read and accessible pictures that could be used in practice you know you can be pointing to the different pictures about this is what we're going to do next this is what we're going to do next these are things we still need to do so there's a range of things that we can provide to help with those uh, you know communication uh, difficulties follow their lead that you know they'll you know if they're slow to speaking slowly or taking time to respond you know they need to be given that extra time and go at that the pace of that of that person um and you know check that they've kind of understood what um what you've told them um you know just and just one example um it's quite a while ago now and not somebody that i was working with but a late you know she'd been in been in to see um the doctor or the nurse and she'd had a, a recent can cancer um diagnosis you know very unfortunately had a, re a cancer diagnosis and was told that the cancer was progressing now for her she had the completely different message because progress for her was well and doing well and was good and all that and it actually that didn't it didn't mean that but she mis misunderstood the kind of the words that were used so check that the individual kind of understands what you've what you've told them and a lot, of, a lot of people I work with over the years, if you ask them something or um, suggest something, they'll straight away will say no. Um, yeah. 
uh, and then over, over time, it might be a short period of time or it might be over a week, they, they process that information and then they've understood it more. And it's, it's just being aware that not to take them on face value as well a lot of time straight away. They, That's they, right. Or they'll tell you what, they, or they may well tell you what it is um, they think you want to hear as well. That's that's the other thing as well, isn't it? So, you know, taking, you know, like you say, taking your time and, and bearing all of those things in, in mind, really. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So just some just some tips really. It's probably not it's probably not rocket science really at all, but using open-ended questions and avoiding those questions that kind of have a yes or no answer. You know, being aware of the body language and the facial expressions could tell you a lot more than actually if they if they're using words to communicate. Um, you can use gestures and facial expressions yourself to reinforce what you what you're saying to somebody you know consider the environment when you're talking to somebody um you know it needs to be where there's not lots of distractions or somebody's you know um particularly anxious or upset about something that's going off over there you know they're being distracted and some people will um find using real kind of tangible objects um helpful when you know trying to communicate with somebody um so that's you know perhaps not entirely um suitable in this this environment but you know it's worth a try if you want to you know say we're well, only do blood pressure this is what the machine is and that sort of thing so some of those kinds of things are useful but they yeah, have mark says you know you, you don't necessarily take their first response on um as, as as red really i suppose it's the need it's time to think about it they might need somebody to help them to understand what it means um and and that, that, that those kinds of things really um the next slide but the next slide is a little video again it's another just a communication tips video so we'll we'll skip over that but again it's only about four minutes long so if you get chance you may get chance just to have a quick look at that as well Obviously, at the heart of COVID, people were staying at home. People were having telephone consultations rather than any kind of face-to-face -face, um, interactions, particularly kind of like in healthcare and stuff like that. So one of our speech and language therapists put together kind of some top tips about how to communicate with somebody with a learning disability on the telephone. So a lot of what we've already said, use common and easy to understand words ask some simple questions to check that they've understood, um, you know, give them plenty of time to answer, uh, perhaps give them one thing to take away or one thing to remember or one thing to do when they've had telephone conversations um, finished. So I'm sorry you can't see it. I can see it on my screen here. Um, but it will be in the slide. It will be in the slide. So take a look at that. And again, a lot of a lot of perhaps what we do for people with a learning disability in terms of the accessible information and the top tips and that sort of thing a lot of this thing a lot of these things are useful for other population groups as well not just for people with a learning disability so if you've got patients who have got mental health problems or you've got people who've got dementia or you know we've got people who english is where english isn't their first language maybe you young people so a lot of these things can be transferred across a lot of the diff of a lot of different population groups not just uh, exclusively for people with a learning disability so worth having a look at uh, if you get if you do get a chance so we'll have the next slide please so why? Why? Why are we? Why, why are we so hung up about health checks, and why are we so hung up about the health of people with a learning disability? Well, they die much younger than people in the general population. People, uh, men will die 22 years um, sooner than men in the general population, and for women, it's for women, it's 27 years. You know, there are quite some. There are some quite significant variations and quite significant uh, differences in you know the you know the time that somebody's going to die and it shouldn't be shouldn't be the case um and often you know it's it's often from things that could have been prevented often you know people are dying from pretty much the same things that 
most of the population are dying from. So things like, you know, respiratory infections, heart disease, cancer, epilepsy, those kinds of things. But, you know, the health check helps to kind of address some of those potential health, health problems. Generally, people with a learning disability are less likely and this is not this you know this is not everybody this is not everybody with a learning disability um but are perhaps less likely to eat a balanced diet and and, and exercise they may not have the opportunities that you or i have for you know physical activity they are less likely to be able to go to the gym go swimming those kinds of things whatever you know whatever you know people's uh, interests are they're much less likely there are financial implications to joining a gym and having the equipment and the, you know all that sort of thing they might need something to go with them which they might, might not have it's quite an intimidating place uh, I'll tell you being in the gym and uh, you know and I haven't got a learning disability so for somebody with a learning disability it's probably even more you know an alien environment for some people so they're less likely to have those opportunities and similarly with you know the balanced diet often they may well have people who choose and choose food and shop and cook for them so perhaps don't have a lot of say over what what food is provided and you know i think over the years we've all seen the very well-meaning carers and mums and dads that pile up plates with you know really big portions or you know on the other hand people are kind of left to their own devices to make unhealthy choices um people with a learning disability again generally not everybody but generally are less likely to survive a cancer diagnosis often it's been picked up at a much later time or a later stage and you know there's a lot less that can be done in those circumstances and they're less likely to access any of the screening programs as well so things don't get picked up in a timely way and really, the rest of the picture is looking pretty grim for somebody who's got a learning disability. Pr practically every health, health complication and health problem that you can think of will be worse for somebody with a learning disability. So are perhaps more likely to be obese, and that could be related to those kind of diet and exercise factors, but also things like medication. And, and you know, there's lots of sort of contributing factors, but much more likely to be uh, overweight and you know that again that kind of like weight loss journey is probably harder for somebody with a learning disability you commercial weight loss groups you know weight watchers swimming world then those kinds of things are probably going to be less suitable for somebody with a learning disability that's not to say people don't go but perhaps they're less likely to go they're less likely to get the help and the support that they might need to lose weight sort of i suppose uh, on the other side of the coin um for older people and perhaps for those people who've got a, a more um, uh, this, this, the, the more severe the learning disability then more likely they are and the older they are to be underweight um so that's something that needs to be uh, borne in mind as well and um, like i say pretty much every other health complication is worse for somebody with a learning disability so diabetes there's a higher incidence of diabetes again that might be linked to the lifestyle factors are much more likely to have a physical and or sensory disability much more likely 22 times higher than the general population likely to have an epilepsy or receive an epilepsy diagnosis at some point during their life increased uh, risk of swallowing problems I've got a slide about osteoporosis, uh, osteoporosis, respiratory problems, dementia and mental health problems. So the picture looks pretty grim, really, if you've got a learning disability. And obviously the annual health check, if people are attending and coming regularly for their annual health check, um, hopefully that can kind of like highlight some of these, these problems before they get too severe or too significant. Um, so I'll concentrate on a couple of those. So the next one, next slide, please. And then that's about osteoporosis. So people with a learning disability are at a higher risk of osteoporosis, osteoporosis and um, low bone density. You know, they don't go out as much. They don't, they're not outside. They haven't got the vitamin D, all that sort of thing. 
the you know mobility perhaps is poorer in some cases so there's lots of risk factors a lot of risk factors affecting people with a learning disability including medication um, and previous sort of history of you know accidents falls that sort of thing so in the north of the county so learning disability services at DC, in dchs are uh, have are um working on a project um that's run by some uh, the physiotherapists to really try and identify those most at risk of osteoporosis and to alert the relevant gps to kind of just bearing that in mind and and, and will they need any extra um supplements or whatever it might be so there is a little bit of a project going on to kind of recognize that this is probably the other the other one of the other fairly significant um issues affecting people with a learning disability and that is constipation or unmanaged constipation so the the leader report which you know was, was previously known as the learning disability mortality review um although it wasn't necessarily um the cause of death in some people constipation was identified as a long-term health problem in a lot of people um, and as was um, you know constipation and bowel issues and we know that people have died there's a couple of a couple of people even here in Derbyshire that have died as a result of unmanaged constipation and, and again it's lifestyle factors maybe it's medication it's you know all sorts of contributing factors and i think it's just something we perhaps need to be um just aware of that there is a higher risk that somebody will will have those problems and um just just at the bottom of the slide there you know some of the things that kind of like people were admitted to hospital because of and actually once some investigations were complete you know done it was actually they're constipated so if they're not eating or drinking if they're being sick um, and all of those things you know and so they were admitted to hospital for those reasons and actually we find out we find out later date that it's a constipation is the the cause so thinking about particularly around the issue of constipation so you know when you, when you see patients who have got a learning learning disability consider that they are likely to be at higher risk of, of being constipated and the potential seriousness of that. So knowing what's normal for them, do they know, do their carers know, are they understanding, you know, what's normal for them? Do they know what the over, uh, you know, overflow means? Are the laxatives working? Are they taking the laxatives? You know, do the carers know when they should be taking them? And do they know what to do if, you know, how to spot the signs of some somebody having um, constipation? And on this slide, there is a link to some easy read because we were a big fan of that. Some easy to read leaflets around constipation and another link. Again, if you get a chance, a, a film that we, we made and that the team supported the making of last year um, that's made by people with a learning disability just to help them to understand about constipation. It's called Pooh Buster. So again, if you get a chance to watch it, do that. And we know, again, this is probably one of the other biggest issues affecting, you know, that we know that um, respiratory problems are probably the biggest cause of the biggest cause of death uh, in people with a learning disability generally. So there's a few things, again, we can think about in primary care. So, so we know that people with a learning disability should get their, their flu, um, flu vaccination and you know carers as well can get their flu vaccination um and i think interestingly um after the covid vaccine after the rollout of the covid vaccination and lots of people were getting their covid vaccinations which is really good about 83 percent of the people that we know about have had at least one covid vaccine so you know the coverage was pretty good and as a result of that, we did see a little bit of an increase in the numbers of people also then getting the flu vaccine. They're rather having them at the same time or feeling more comfortable with getting the flu vaccine. So the uptake of the flu vaccine has gone up over the last couple of years. But again, talking to people at their annual health check about why it's important to get it um, and thinking about 
you know reasonable adjustments for some people who you know injections might not be the, the thing for them so being able to perhaps consider the nasal spray as an alternative we know it's not licensed for adults but it, it can it can be excuse me it can be given um, and you know this again some thought around actually it might not be as effective but maybe some coverage is better than the non as I mentioned COVID vaccines and we have supported an accessible COVID vaccination clinic for uh, not necessarily just for patients with a learning disability but for lots of people who have struggled to go to the general um, vaccination hubs so we've we've supported some people who wouldn't have otherwise have had the vaccine to get the COVID vaccination. And you know, thinking about capacity, um, it it might be that the patient doesn't have the capacity to make that decision for themselves. That that net shouldn't really be the barrier. That shouldn't really um prevent somebody from having it you know there is that kind of option of discussing what is in the best interest of the patient and it will almost sort of certainly always be in the best interest to be you know have vaccines to protect them um you know in a carer mum dad you know all say you know i think they should still have it even if they can't make that decision from them for themselves and thinking about the swallowing problems, we know that there's an increased risk of having swallowing problems in people who've got, you know, um, learning disabilities and the speech and language therapists in the, in the specialist learning disability team can will do um, assessments for, for swallowing issues as well. So, you know, and that might be a conversation to have with carers as well is like, do they understand or do they know? the signs of when somebody's struggling um you know if they're drooling or you know whatever it might be where maybe the carers don't realize that they are having problems swallowing and it's it's gone on for a long time um and there's just a couple of links on that slide just again to resources and easy easier to read uh, information about the vaccinations We've mentioned the annual health check already. So the annual health check really is crucial to addressing, you know, pretty much all of the physical health problems for people with a learning disability that they experience, and they will experience a lot. So everybody on the register over the age of 14, and we've talked about issues around your registers. So get your health facilitator. If you're in Derbyshire, get your link health facilitator to check your register. They're more, far more likely to have lots of health conditions and you know they're going to also have some of those social problems so the lack of support they're going to be you know maybe lack of meaningful occupation you know lack of uh, meaningful relationships all that sort of thing so you know there's a, a benefit of uh, the social prescribing for people with a learning disability as well so that's something else to, to think so just once people are due in for their appointment it is worth taking the time to familiar outside familiarize yourself with the patient's background and you know have you seen them recently for what for is there any test results that need to be checked anything like that familiarize yourself with how that patient communicates um so that you know the interactions are as, as kind of as meaningful as possible and if they come to you with something they may have a health action plan they may have a health assessment they may have something that they bought with them and there may be a specific subject or something that they, that's bothering them that they want to talk about that they want to get off the chest so it's important to kind of address some of those issues you know to begin with as well so this is it's an, an example of a, a pre-health check questionnaire now we wouldn't say that these are in any way compulsory it may not work for every single patient um but it helps to identify like i said they might come in with something like this it might help to identify the issues that they do have um, going on and some of the stuff that actually might be all right you know we might not need to worry about too much um useful perhaps for patients where they have got paid carers where you know they come in with a different member of staff every time or they've got new staff or different you know and they don't necessarily know the patient ever so well if they can have this filled in and bring it with them that 
will help the appointment and help to kind of get to the bottom of what the priorities are for that individual might be useful as well for new patients if they've you know the first time they're attending so you, you younger patients or people have never been before um so it's just an, an example and say so it's 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 a suggestion it might not be something that's particularly um relevant to every patient some you know some patients you might know really well you might know what the health issues are they don't need it but if you don't know them they've not been in before they're a new patient it might be useful to have this filled in and it helps you to kind of identify what what they're worried about as well um can we have the next slide please <clears throat> so this is <clears throat> just some information really about the annual health check template and over the last um sort of three months in the run-up to christmas we did do the, the health facilitation team did do some quality checking we did volunteer and practices volunteered for us to go and have a little closer look at the, you know what was happening with their annual health checks you know things like length of appointment you know who who in the practice was delivering the health check were they recording reason adjustments that's sort of thing and one of the one of the i suppose one of the challenges for some practices is the the use of an appropriate health check template now the enhanced service guidance does not actually specify it's not that prescriptive about you know using a specific template i think it just says using an electronic template but there was i think in 20 17 maybe 2018 a national electronic template for learning disability health checks was launched um uh, and that said that's a really useful one but we recognize that a lot of practices use ardens templates and again that's okay because it almost pretty much exactly mirrors what's in the national template so if you're using either of those two then you're likely to be you know covering every base you're likely to be covering all the health issues and all the right questions and in the templates there's lots of kind of drop down boxes for free text and guide it links to guidance and that sort of thing and i think as well perhaps crucially those templates will have all the appropriate uh, relevant read codes for the claims for completed health checks and that sort of thing so what we'd probably say is if you're not using one or other of these, then check what it is you are using and make sure that it's, it's got all the right codes in it. Um, and we'd recommend that you just kind of like pick one and stick to it so that anybody in the practice who's delivering annual health checks, you're all kind of singing from the same hymn sheet or using the same template so that it creates a kind of a bit of a consistency for all of the patients with a learning disability. And again, if you've got any questions or queries about templates, which ones to use, how to find it, where to get it from, that sort of thing, then do get in touch and we can we can direct you um, about the templates. The enhanced service, and this hasn't changed for anybody who knows, who knows who's been doing this for a long time, the, the requirements of the enhanced service haven't changed significantly uh, for a number of years so so this is stuff that's kind of been in place for a very long time so this is kind of the stuff that should be included as a minimum and I say if you're using one of those templates it'll be covered it'll be covered in the template so a provision of you know that um help health promotion advice and that's where some of that accessible information might might come in uh, useful that people with a learning disability are perhaps less likely to get their health promotion advice you know from radio and tv campaigns or reading about it in magazines or books or whatever or newspapers they're less likely to kind of access that type of health promotion campaign so you know if you've got stuff that you can give to people to take away you know and to have a look at and go over that kind of the chronic illness and system inquiry the physical examination is actually quite important and as you know we're thinking about you know weights and blood pressures because we know that there's an issue around obesity there's those lifestyle factors but also things like looking in ears and looking at feet and that sort of thing and so a physical exam examination is quite crucial a check on their epilepsy and you know it might not be everybody's specialist subject but you know if if it's not then are they are they 
open or could they be referred to a neurologist or a epilepsy specialist nurse if they're not already a check on behavior and mental health and that's really to think about carers might be telling you that a behavior has changed or a new behavior you know something something's different something's not right here is it that they're telling us that there's something wrong or they've got tummy ache tooth ache whatever it might be so we want to rule out some of those physical potential physical causes before we explore go down that you know is it a mental health um, issue syndrome specific checks as well so thinking perhaps perhaps most commonly for people who have down syndrome so thyroid thyroid function and checking hearts and that sort of thing um, is, is is important and there is a guide i think the rcgp have got a specific guide around some of those syndrome specific things health action plans and say which is something we want to kind of um improve on not everybody that comes for a health check gets a health action plan and we want we want to improve that talking about the medicines and again it might be around are the medicines appropriately prescribed thinking about the stomp stamp thing you know is people being prescribed are people being prescribed stuff you know it's a little bit outside of what what it was intended for or you know do we just check that people are taking the medicines are they prescribed in the right you know are they having liquids where liquids might be appropriate or not that sort of thing so are they taking the medicines are they prescribed in that way as well referring on so if somebody does need you know a, a referral on and to secondary care are we telling them that they've got a learning disability that gives them a chance to implement some of those reasonable just and so I think if your patient's got a learning disability and you're referring them on, I think it's okay to say this patient's got a learning disability. And that transitional stuff as well, you're you're going to be seeing people who are 14 and over, you know, there's a there's a bit of a leap from you know children's services into adult services and you know, you know, the, I suppose GP and primary care are the people that kind of can see can see that coming if you like and make sure that everything is in place for when that young person either reaches 18 or 21 or whatever that cutoff might be if, they, if they're in school they might stay in school till 21 if they're in college or further education they might be there till the 25 um so you know they might, they're eligible for an adult service from the age of 18 so there's lots of drops where people could just slip through the net but the primary care can see can see those can see those come in um next slide please i'm just conscious of the time we i need to talk fast <laughs> health action plans and we have I mean, i've mentioned this a couple of times so this is a, a plan for the patient and, and I've, in that slide there's a little image of, of an accessible health action plan um and it's really helpful for them to understand how they can stay healthy some perhaps some key points about what they need to do um, and perhaps you know identifying if possible who might help them it might be mom dad carer it might be yourselves in primary care it might be you know practice nurse who kind of does an asthma check or whatever it might be and some kind of time scale as as to when we're going to look at this problem again depending on what it and what it is if you know if it's a blood pressure you know you might say i want to see you back here in a, in a week or two weeks we'll check it again if you know it could be you know if, well i would like you to lose a bit of weight so we'll come, come back and see me in a couple of months you know it could be any number of things um that could go on there depending on what the health issues are um i will have the next next slide please so barriers and there are the barriers to healthcare for a lot for lots of, of population groups, but probably it's probably harder um, for people with a learning disability. So, you know, the services and like we said, it's not about the physical access to buildings necessarily. You know, particularly these days, everybody's got, you know, lovely brand new health centres and, you know, purpose built buildings. But that being able to make an appointment, can I see the person I want to see when I get there? will they know i'm here how do i tell them you know will they you know how long am i going to get kept waiting so those kinds of issues how do, how do 
practices contact patients is it a standard type written letter letter because if it is it might go in the bin they might not be able to understand it they might bury it under a pile of other papers that we've all got in our kitchens perhaps people would be scared people may well have had negative experiences in the past they might be frightened about coming to the doctors particularly if they're worried that something's wrong so people will be frightened so might put off coming to the doctors that lack of knowledge and lack of confidence, and that might be on, on, on both parts, really, on the patient who's got a learning disability and maybe on practitioners if they're not ever so used to kind of supporting people with a learning disability. So that can kind of work both ways. Again, the poor information, we get our information from all sorts of places. You know, we'll Google it, maybe, you know, you see articles in magazines or on the news or whatever. People with a learning disability have less less access to that information the diagnostic overshadowing we and we think that is still a problem i think where people can go oh, well it's because he's got a learning disability maybe not maybe it's because he's got tummy ache or you know whatever it might be so we want to try and address those kinds of issues for people with a learning disability too and communication um, but we've, we've talked about that but we know that there are significant communication problems for people with a learning disability Right, can we have the next slide, please? So, again, something to think about. It might be um, just having a, having a, um, a check on the, per, the patient's circumstances. You know, quite often for people with a learning disability, it wasn't that they didn't attend or they chose not to attend. It could be that they, they were not bought, brought to their appointment. Similar, you, know, you have a similar thing for children. Um, and actually we need to think about the same kinds of issues for people with a learning disability if they haven't got help to get to the surgery they might be help reliant on other people to get their appointments um, that sort of thing um, the appointment times might not be suitable people will forget so some I know some practices might have quite a strict you know do not did not attend uh, policy for some patients and, and for some patients that might entirely be entirely appropriate but i would you know just I, su I suppose proceed with caution if it's somebody who's got a learning disability because it could be something that's completely out of their out of their control um next slide please i'm, I'm being quick now so things you can do so make sure that the that the person has, is on the learning disability register and we can help with that to check that everybody's on there that should be and supporting people to attend for annual health checks you know providing that kind of invitation in a way that's that's accessible and understandable to somebody encouraging people to get the vaccinations the flu and covid if they've not already had them providing the health action plan um and being aware of the referral processes and which we, which I have got a slide on as well um, and just encouraging those healthy lifestyle choices so just very I won't, I won't read them all out um, but these kinds of just soft signs that um, might indicate that something's not quite right and I think the bit at the bottom says you know the carers will be telling you the carers may well come and say I can't put my finger on it but there's something not right and each one of these things sort of taken in isolation may not raise huge kind of red flags or alarm bells but actually for somebody with a learning disability particularly if they've got more than one of these it's going to be almost or always worth investigating particularly when carers are telling you something not right is not right it's not himself um so we sort of encourage you know not to dismiss some of these things that actually on the face of it perhaps aren't um aren't huge red flags uh, next slide please so this is a, just a little bit about how to refer so depending on where you are in derbyshire um the learning disability services are offered by two separate trusts so it's dchs in the north of the county it's derbyshire healthcare for derby city and for the south of the county um about 12 months ago or perhaps a little less there was um those two services kind of um merged i don't think i'm allowed to say merged i don't think that's what it was but i'm going to say that 
so they've joined together so it perhaps helps to eliminate some of that kind of postcode lottery as to what sort of learning disability service you get depending on where you live in Derbyshire so it hopefully provides a better uh, access for everybody across Derbyshire to get um, a service the moment there are still unfortunately still two referral processes so there's two email addresses one for the south and the city and one for the north and if you're not sure then get in touch we can let you know which one it is because some practices do sit right on the border of of those two organizations you don't necessarily there is a referral form you don't necessarily need it you can just email with obviously the patient's details and the re reason for the referral and what we've got is a single point of access so the referral will come into the single point of access it will be discussed and then it will be allocated to the most suitable professional for that particular issue and we would say avoid using um, the choose and choose and book system because that kind of um it doesn't work for, for the way that we accept referrals. So what it does is generates a, 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 an appointment and then we have to get in touch with the patient and really using the choose and book just delays the whole kind of process. So avoid using the choose and book, send an email to, to the whichever, whichever one you need to send it to. Uh, next slide, please. And this just covers just some of those issues that you might want to refer uh, to specialist services for. So specialist services work in episodes of care now, so they will need to be referred for a specific health reason. And, you know, this, this is not an, an exhaustive list, but they will need to be re referred for a specific health reason. And there's lots and lots of things that people will, will be seen for. And there's lots the team makes up of, of a number of, of different professionals. We've got nurses and physios and occupational therapists and so on. Um, so it goes, like I say, through the single point of access and allocated to the most appropriate professional within the team. Again, if you need any advice or you need some pointers or if you need any kind of support with referrals, then do get in touch and we can help with that too. Right. Um, let's have the next slide, please. Sorry. And just um, very, very quickly, um, the acute trusts all have a learning disability lead or a learning disability liaison nurse. Um, so you might get in touch with them it's perhaps more likely that you will give their information to the patient or to their family. So, you know, if they've got a planned appointment or they know they need to go, then by all means, get in touch with the learning disability liaison uh, nurse or lead at the hospital. If the hospital that you refer to isn't on this list, again, we, let us know. We can find out who it is because we've got hospitals that, you know, Stockport and Mansfield and we've got, you know, anywhere in where anybody in Derbyshire might end up in hospital, we've got the links these are perhaps the most obvious ones. Um, next slide, please. So we've got um, on Derbyshire Healthcare website, we've got some health check pages. So there's some information there about all sorts of things. So there's some stuff around the um, templates and um, all sorts of stuff so if you're kind of thinking mm, I, don't, I can't remember or oh, I need to find something then look at, look at the website and next couple of slides are just oh yeah there we go that's the website so you can have a look on there the next couple of slides are just again additional links for resources just to support the annual health checks the rcgp guide is quite well known there's a toolkit in there like a step by step and there's lots of information in there um and again i think the next slide is again just some information about for carers and covid vaccinations and the last slide there we go um, I think I may have gone a little bit over time, but so apologies if you're waiting to go and have your tea um, that gone a bit over time. If anybody's got any questions, we're quite happy to help. If we don't know the answer, we can go away and find out if anybody's got anything they want to ask us.
Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Rachel and Mark, for being here this evening. And as I said before, giving up your time, it's really, really been so useful. And particularly all the extra bits you've given us, the extra contacts and that YouTube video <laughs> that we've all heard. <laughs> that was that would no, that that was really, really, um, really, really useful. So thank you very much for that. Um, everybody, we've got the next den. Well, as I said. Firstly, in terms of this session, we will be sending out feedback. So if people can fill it in, that will be great. And then we'll be able to send it out to Rachel and Mark as well. So thank you for that. So um, I'm Elise Brogan. I'm a GP in Derbyshire. And I also am the GP lead for Derbyshire Education Network. So we run these education um, sessions. We will be asking for feedback at the end and we really value your feedback. I read them all and any suggestions you make, I really do try and make sure that we give you that. Um, so please do fill in your feedback at the end if you can, that'd be great. And you do get a lovely certificate. So just remember that there's, there's that little prize if you do fill in the feedback for us. So um, other things to know, as you've entered, you'll know that you are, this is being recorded. So if you have a friend who um, misses out on this, do let them know that they can watch this afterwards. They just contact LGP Task Force. We can send them the link. Um, and if we just try and keep on mute for now, that would be great. And we'll, um, I'll ask Rachel in a moment how she would like questions to be um, answered. So I think that's everything. Um, Rachel and Mark have got wonderful introductions for themselves. So is that okay if I hand over to you, Rachel, and you let me know when you want me to start the PowerPoint? Uh, you can start it and uh, go to slide two if you like. That's that's the that's our first yeah, starting yeah. point. Tells tells everybody who we are. So um, so I'm Rachel Johnson. I'm the lead strategic health facilitator, and my colleague Mark is here as well too. So we are the uh, dis learning disability strategic health facilitation team we work for derbyshire healthcare we are learning disability nurses and there are um five of us in the team plus we have three assistants in our team who have got a learning disability themselves so they often help us with this sort of thing we we, we get their kind of experiences and their kind of thoughts on, on various sort of things that we do so as the health facilitation team, although we sit in the adult neurodevelopmental service, we aren't a patient facing team. We don't generally see patients. We do um, lots of other things, really. The core bit of our role is to support practices with um, delivering um, the, um, the learning disability annual health check. So we don't necessarily see patients, but we can help you with lots of other things. So we cover between the team, we cover every practice. We link with every practice in Derby and Derbyshire. So currently about 111 practices. So about not far away from 6,000 patients that we know about who have got a learning disability or who are eligible for the learning disability health check. So we couldn't see them all individually as you could probably appreciate. So we, we do lots of things. So we will look at learning disability registers in practices and make sure that you've got the right people on the lists. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in, in a few slides time. We deliver lots of training and awareness raising to primary care staff, um, anybody that's involved in the delivery of annual health checks, really. So your GPs, your practice nurses, nurse practitioners, HCAs, pharmacists. Um, we hold regular uh, bookable sessions for, for people to come along and, and, and attend that. And it is part of the enhanced service sort of agreement that, that staff re receive regular updates. We help with lots of queries and questions about how to support patients with a learning disability, um, signposting and that sort of thing. Sometimes there's not a lot to signpost to you know the nature of social social care and the rest of it but we, we help with that what we want to do is promote as well as support the provision of health action plans for people with a learning disability and that's something for us as a team we want to we want to improve obviously promoting annual health checks and we do that in lots of ways we do that a lot with families and carer groups and people with a learning disability young people we've done school you know we've done stuff in schools and for young for young people so we want people to know about health checks and know how to get them. Uh, we help with systems such as flagging, advising about reason adjustments and things to think about. We, um, along with our assistants in our team, we 
um, share and create some easy, easy read material. So if there's something you think actually could do with this in an accessible form, we've probably got it. Um, and we work with the local leader program um, around the deaths of people with a learning disability and um, looking at the themes and the lessons learned from people dying uh, much younger than, than in the general population. And we work with co other colleagues as well right across sort of the ICB and NHS England and stuff to kind of um, do all of those things. So do you want to move? Oh, I feel like Chris Whitty. Do you want to move on to the next slide? <laughs> I do. So just very kind of briefly, um, um, you know, that kind of like what is a learning disability? So uh, significantly in reduced ability to understand new or complex information, information um, and impaired social functioning. So this can range from basic kind of day-to-day -day tasks. And crucially, a learning disability will have started before adulthood. So anybody who acquires a brain injury, after the age of 18 is not classed as having a learning disability so you really you've got to tick all of those three boxes to kind of um to confirm that it's a learning disability now the question around iq often kind of raises it raises itself and you can request you can request uh, an assessment a psychology assessment to check somebody's iq however our psychology department is not going to be very happy with us if every if we did that for everybody that we knew so what we want to look at as well or what we want to think about is other kind of factors that might be present so do they live in a you know, in a home that would recognize as some being somewhere that people with a learning disability live do they use learning disability services you know have they got a job they may have a job but it's probably a job that you don't need any exams or qualifications for um, we look at you know uh, if, you know their abilities and things like that things that they, they might need help to do so that's it in a nutshell uh, we'll go we'll go to the next slide I'll just briefly explain it we're, we're struggling with the technology I certainly am so there's a little film here it's only a couple of minutes long but it's just kind of people with a learning disability explaining what it means to have a learning disability if you do get a chance have a, have a quick watch so we'll go to the next slide please so this just kind of like, I suppose, highlights the, the, the differences and the severity of a learning disability. So for somebody who's got a profound disability, you know, their IQ will be less than 20. Again, we're not testing their IQ at this point. It's fairly obvious that they've got a significant learning disability. They will almost certainly need round the clock care and support and you need help with all of their kind of activities of daily living. At the other end of the scale, if you like, if that's the right word to use, at the other end, uh, we've got lots of people, lots of people we know about who've got a mild learning disability. So they're on that edge, sort of an IQ of between 50 and 70. And actually, from a health point of view, they are the people that we probably worry about the most because they have probably got less help with making appointments where they've got less help to identify if something's wrong or you know some somebody's not feeling themselves or there's something not quite right and in terms of checking that testing that you know there might be an option for iq testing if somebody's right on that edge and if it's a difference between an eligibility for services or not um so there's a there's a possibility but we're not going to get um, everybody that we know iq tested for the sake of it almost. 